All right, good afternoon and welcome everybody to National Beauty Graphic. Come on in. Um, today it is a distinct pleasure because how often do you get to say Indiana Jones and Neil Armstrong in the same sentence? But today is one of those days. Um, so the fanboy inside me is going nuts. Um, because we're fortunate today to have Dr. Justin Walsh, he's an associate professor of art history and archaeology at Chapman University. Um, he's also one of our grantees. We funded him for his work in Spain. But he has a bold new project um, to investigate human behavior and what a real space archaeology may look like. And he'd like to share sort of what he's doing right now with us all now. So let's give a warm Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It is a great pleasure to be here. Um, again, as Matt said, uh, I did receive a CRE grant uh, this year for an excavation of money in the south of Spain, which um, was incredibly helpful for helping us get a lot of good work done there. Uh, but as he said, I'd like to talk about another project that I'm uh, trying to get off the ground at the moment, together with um, my co-primary uh, investigator, Dr. Alice Gorman, who is at Flinders University uh, in Adelaide, Australia. So we're not just uh, going up to space, but around the world as well. Um, and before I really get into uh, the nitty gritty of the project, and what we're proposing to do, uh, I need to explain a little bit about uh, this term space archaeology. So I just saw her face 15 feet high yeah. <laughs> uh, going into the uh, cafeteria. Um, uh, that was just perfect. Uh, Sarah Parkak, I'm sure you're all aware of her and her work, uh, which is tremendous work. She's obviously been doing really exciting things um, with what she is referring to as space archaeology. Um, but which is a little bit different from what I'm talking about. Um, and so obviously uh, she has been uh, a real face for archaeology uh, to the public over the last uh, couple of years uh, with her work in discovering new sites around the world uh, and bringing them to public attention. Uh, and see her here presenting you know, some of the satellite imagery she's been working with. And that is actually uh, what she does, what she is working on is uh, using imagery that's taken from space, but that's focused on terrestrial sites. Uh, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about space archaeology is uh, an archaeology that focuses on human activity in space uh, or human activity on Earth that's directed at space. So we could talk about uh, Cape Canaveral and the launch sites there. That could be space archaeology. Um, and in fact, actually, we have somebody here in the audience who's the Federal Preservation Officer at NASA headquarters. Um, and who is also an archaeologist, and she's concerned with a lot of those issues. Um, but uh, also thinking about uh, what archaeology might mean in space itself. Um, and I know that this might sound like a really uh, uh, kind of new topic, a really uh, kind of uh, uh, surprising idea, the idea that we might even perform archaeology in space. But in fact, it's actually something that um, my colleagues and I have been discussing for the better part of the last 15 years or so. Um, it's worth thinking about the human impact on space. Um, my uh, co-PI uh, has, has written about how uh, this new uh, uh, kind of putative geologic period that we may be said to be entering the Anthropocene, you might have heard that term uh, before, this idea that, that human, humans have had as a species such an impact on the Earth that now we can be safely said to be entering a new geologic period uh, called the Anthropocene. Uh, she has argued, in fact, that this can be measured not just on our planet, but for example, obviously, the radio waves we've been sending out to the universe for 100 years, so 100 light years from us, uh, and even the Voyager and Pioneer space probes that are now exiting our solar system, that these also represent uh, our, uh, our culture and our, our footprint on the universe, uh, and in fact, as I was just saying to Matt at lunch, you know, we can really talk about Voyager and Pioneer as being cultural objects because they're intended to be communications with other life forms should they encounter them. Uh, here is an image that, that represents uh, a kind of a, a, a conceptualization of <coughs> low Earth orbit and the objects that we've placed there, thousands and thousands of objects. In fact, actually, if you want to be uh, really serious about it, we can talk about millions of objects that have been placed in space since uh, 1957. Um, and these are uh, orbiting at various altitudes. Um, they are whizzing around, and there are so many of them now 
uh, people who work in the space industry are very concerned about the possibility of the damage they might create. Um, and because most of this, over 85% of it, is non-functioning or just debris, uh, it's often referred to as junk. I don't know how many of you who saw the film Wally when it came out. Mm -hmm. This is one of my personal favorites, actually, not just because of the space aspect of it. I think it's a terrific film. I actually it happened to be on last weekend, so I was able to, <laughs> to see it again, and it really just struck me. Uh, thinking about um, when the spacecraft lifts off uh, from the planet, and the planet is literally enclouded by, uh, by uh, space junk. Um, and the robot Wally is kind of hanging on to the side. It's a little blurry here. Uh, but the spacecraft flies out of Earth, pushes through that cloud of junk, and then what's the first thing that it's shown doing is flying past a heritage site, I think we could fairly argue, one of the Apollo landing sites, uh, with a sign that flickers on, presumably triggered by the passing of the spaceship, saying there's an outlet mall coming soon on the moon. <laughs> Um, and the, the whole movie is really a, about um, this tension between humanity's uh, greatest achievements and our, uh, our also our propensity to damage and destroy the world around us. Um, and so I, I don't think it's by accident that it's showing those aspects of our space heritage, uh, that is to say the satellites orbiting the Earth, but also the Apollo site. And obviously we can think of these sites as historically significant and culturally significant. And, and we do think about those things. There's an entire museum on the mall that's based around this idea, right? And in fact, actually, it turns out that that museum is the single most visited historic collection in the world, <coughs> more than the Louvre, which would be the number one art museum in the world uh, by annual attendance. Uh, if you combine uh, the main campus here and out at Dulles, it is something like half a million or a million more people visit that, that, that institution than any other historic collection in the world. Uh, which shows the interest that people have in it and the significance that we attribute to it. Um, and, and having, and so here you see it, but actually this is an old photograph I just visited yesterday, and obviously they've changed things around. Uh, this is no longer in the entryway of the museum. It's been removed and been replaced by the lunar module that they have in their collection. It's no longer either in its plexiglass casing. It's actually just out there for you to see. Um, so we have public and private collections that contain this stuff, we can start to think of it as heritage. That kind of what I'm trying to lay out here is how space archaeologists have started to think about and conceptualize our potential subject. And the first thing we kind of have to do is say, how do we, how do we claim this as a legitimate subject? How do, we, how do we make sure that people understand that it really is something archaeological? Um, and so here's another example of, of a piece of space heritage, in this case being moved to a new institution uh, just one of many gigantic things that have been moved around LA lately. I don't know if you've uh, seen anything about this, but we had we had uh, Endeavor here. We had the, uh, the external tank uh, a couple of months ago uh, from space shuttle moved through. We had that giant rock move through. I keep wondering what's next. What big thing can we move around LA? Anyway, uh, I have to show this too because this uh, Randy's Donuts, and this was around the corner for where I used to live up until about three weeks ago. But in any case, there other ways in which we can talk about or see that we talk about uh, space objects as heritage. And Google has been a big part of this. If you go in Google Earth, there's a section where you can choose, actually, the moon. And if you look at the moon, all these little dots here are things that we put there. You can even visit Tranquility Base, and there, there's clickable video, mm -hmm. et cetera. And the little uh, kind of 3D model of the lunar module, which actually couldn't look like this because the top half is still attached. Uh, but in any case, uh, it is possible for us to virtually visit uh, sites like this. And indeed, it actually is possible for us to treat these objects as heritage, as in fact, the states of California and New Mexico have recently done with regard to the objects that were left behind uh, at Tranquility Base. And it's a kind of a quirk of international law that because of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, no government can have jurisdiction over anything in space. It is totally international territory. And for those of us who are in archaeology or have a heritage management, this presents certain issues. Because we can't protect anything there. Right? There's no law that can be created, no policy that can be created that says this stuff should be preserved. But I think we can clearly argue that the site, that is to say the landscape, and also the objects are worthy of preservation because this, for example, particularly at Tranquility Base, will always be 
uh, the first place that humans ever set foot on anything that wasn't the Earth. So it's, it's undoubtedly maybe even the most significant archaeological site that there is. And you might say, well, it's not under threat, so why do we need even these kind of, uh, uh, maybe we could say Potemkin uh, sort of uh, uh, protections? Um, because California can say it's protected, but it's not really protected. Why do we need that? Maybe you uh, have heard of the Lunar X Prize competition, uh, which is sponsored by Google, uh, which is going to award $20 million to the first team that can put a rover on the moon, move it 500 meters, and send back video. This was actually supposed to happen in early 2012, but it still hasn't happened yet. There's a bonus prize that called the Heritage Bonus, worth about a million dollars. And it says if you can send back video of a previous landing site, then you get that extra money. I was concerned enough to write, or co-author, in fact, with a student of mine, an op-ed calling for them to withdraw the heritage bonus because uh, I'm concerned, what if there's a catastrophic near success and they crash into one of these sites by accident, right? Or the rover rolls over part of the site. So NASA, uh, a few years ago, in consultation with archaeologists who have worked on this, uh, particularly Beth O'Leary, who recently retired from New Mexico State University, uh, has put out a white paper with guidelines requesting that entities, other entities do not encroach on certain of these sites, particularly Apollo 11 and Apollo 17, which are the first and the last missions. Um, and the X Prize competitors have agreed to uh, respect that. Um, but, uh, but we can see that going forward, as the commercial space industry increases, particularly as tourism might increase, that these are going to continue to be potentially threatened. Um, so in any case, we can think about these objects certainly as junk, but we can also think about them as heritage. Here's actually, this is the California record, objects associated with tranquility, because they can only protect the objects, or even claim to protect the objects, because again, the landscape cannot be protected, so the footprints, for example, are can certainly be threatened <coughs> to the extent that they survive. This is uh, Beth O'Leary's map that she created of uh, the archaeological site at Apollo 11 which included not just the lunar module and certain specific objects that we know to have been left, but we also know that they were concerned, NASA was, about the potential weight of lifting off the moon now that they had all these moon rocks, all these lunar samples on board. So they, they were told, you have eight minutes, throw everything you're not going to need out. So they created a trash pile outside of the, uh, outside of the lunar module. So, um, so that would be compared to a mid on Earth. And the objects sometimes that are left behind have cultural significance. Charlie Duke with Apollo 16 left a photograph of his family on the moon, although he said that it started to turn brown almost immediately from the heat of the lunar day. Um, but here you can see it, in the act, it actually had an inscription on the back of it saying that it was him and his family, and it was a picture taken in Houston. Um, there's art on the moon, uh, like this sculpture, which was a memorial to astronauts who had died prior to Apollo 15 both uh, Russian and American astronauts who had died. Um, it was just a, it's about three, four inches tall. There it is, with a card listing the names of all the astronauts who were known to have died um, in, in various mission accidents. Um, so there's a memorial on the moon. And then, of course, there is, this is a scene from a liftoff of one of the lunar modules, but you can see all the footprints Right? So this, these are clearly archaeological sites um, with traces of human activity, or even rover tracks as well right, left behind. And we can see these images, by the way, there's a terrific exhibition in the Air and Space Museum of photographs taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance <coughs> orbiter, orbiter camera uh, that shows the sites with the footprints clearly visible still today. The flags are still visible. So what about doing archaeology in space? Doing archaeology in space. Well, this is a real problem, right? Because traditionally, what do we do as archaeologists? We go and we dig, right? We dig up soil and we record the locations of those objects, and then we try and piece together a story uh, about what happened in that location, about the culture that was there and the society that was there and how people lived their lives. So I'll just admit at the beginning that this, uh, this project came to me kind of out of a bit of frustration. Maybe I shouldn't admit this with a NASA person in the room. But frustration when I saw, I think you'll understand, 
uh, I mean, they saw the call for astronaut applications in November of last year, and it specifically precluded people with social science degrees from applying. You could have a BA in science, but a PhD in archaeology was no good. Um, and so, uh, it's, and not only did it say no so social sciences, it said in parentheses, archaeology, anthropology, <laughs> and this should be concerning to you, geography. Um, and I was thinking, boy, this really tells me that they don't value what we do. They don't understand how what we can do might be of use to them. And uh, how can I possibly get that story across to them? That, that so the social sciences might have some real benefit for what they're trying to accomplish. Because undoubtedly, you know, they've, they've done decades of research, for example, on uh, the physiological effects of spending time in space. We know about Scott Kelly, who actually was just talking at my university on Wednesday night. Um, and uh, we know that he spent a year in space, and they can compare him to his twin brother, who spent time the same amount of time on Earth, and what happens with the two of them. Uh, over that time span, they've also done psychological studies, lots and lots of psychological studies on what it means to spend time in space. Um, but if, up until now, there hasn't been any kind of study of what it means to uh, look at the society or the culture that's created in these contexts. So it occurred to me that ISS might be a perfect place to do this. Um, it is a, it, there's no doubt that it can be treated as an archeological site. Uh, it's, uh, it was first conceived in 1984, first element went up in 1998, and it's been continuously occupied for almost 5,800 days. There are actually currently three people in orbit who are on their way there be a part of Expedition 50 that will arrive there tomorrow. Uh, five space agencies and people from 25 nations have been a part of this. So it's a really different kind of thing going on than, say, the Apollo missions, right? Where we were talking about two countries that were involved in this military struggle and that were competing with one another. It was very masculine. We're talking about a multi-ethnic, multi-gendered space. So this is an, a new development in, the, in human habitation of space. 1,000 cubic meters of habitable space. This is likened normally to a five-bedroom house. Orbiting above us in low Earth orbit, and it is the single most expensive construction project that humanity has ever undertaken, with rough estimates of its cost to date at $150 billion. But I think it's also really compelling to think about it using this particular phrase, which actually comes from a 1972 report from the National Academy of Sciences. I love this phrase, a micro society in a mini world. I'm going to beat it into the ground in this project. That that's what the interior of a spacecraft is. And as NASA, for example, plans for three year long or longer missions to Mars and, and wherever, that it might behoove them to understand better uh, what that means, the society that's created um, in this space and the culture uh, that goes along with it. It's an incredibly complicated space uh, with multiple modules that have been put up over time. Uh, the habitable modules are mostly along this, this axis and a couple down here, and then we've got the truss that holds the solar panels uh, for power. And we can think about the social structures on a number of different axes, right? and how those then might be visible to us, mission objectives and goals, that philosophy and value systems, the composition of personnel, that how they're organized, hierarchy or lack of hierarchy, um, tech, the technology that's being used, the physical environment that these people are inhabiting and that they can't get out of, and they're there for three or six months at a time or a year at a time the cultural and social environment, and of course, the, the actual passage of time. Those, all of these are things that archaeology is good at investigating, as it turns out. And so we can and we should take a look at them. But the question is, how do we get from <coughs> this, sorry, I should say, from this to this? That's me in Spain. Um, how do we get from a space like this to approaching it archaeologically? And that's really been the puzzle. That's been the block to space archaeology up until this point. It occurs to me, though, that NASA and the other space agencies have been recording what they've been doing the whole time with thousands and thousands of images, video, audio, 
Can we do something with that data? I mean, look at this space. There's religious objects in here. This is actually the table that they eat at. He's exercising. These are crew quarters where they sleep and where they, where they can get some privacy, maybe. So my idea is, in this project, to build a 3D model of the space station. I should say, we don't need to build necessarily the whole space station, because there's probably too much for us to do the whole thing, or all the missions of it. We'll probably concentrate just on one or two modules and one or two missions to start with. And then we can iterate out from that, of course. Um, but we can build a 3D model of it. And then we can take those images and that audio and that video, and we can actually place them as layers on the inside of that space and index them for time using the metadata attached to those images. And then we can catalog all of the things that we and people that we see in there and how those objects move over time as we observe them and how those people interact with those spaces and with those objects and start to do archaeology that way. Uh, here, and just hold on a second, and don't click yet. Uh, here we have a screen capture from an ESA, that is the European Space Agency, virtual model, virtual tour of the site. So now if you want to click and see if we can go to the web browser. This, is a, this can give us some imagination of, first of all, its feasibility, and second of all, what it would be like. This is a weirdly empty version of the ISS because there's no people visible in any of these images. But to create something like this, where we also have a timeline, a slider, right, that we could choose any moment in the station's history of habitation and catalog what we see. One of the other things that I'd really like to get my hands on, if I can get permission, is the inventory management system, that is, say, the database of all of the objects that they put up there. That would be a really great seed for the database that we want to create. Right? It also includes locational information. We can actually move through space, and actually, if you, maybe you can click on this right here. This right here, where it says destiny. Yeah. So this is actually a US model. I guess that's actually where we were. Let's click on the next one up, oh, node two, Unity. This is where they actually, where the crew actually, where four of the crew sleep. If you can turn around, you can see we've got a work table there, all these different objects, right? We can catalog all of this. So there are crew quarters here. There is a galley here. There is uh, there is uh, toilet facilities here. There are exercise equipment. There's also working. So I think the destiny and node two are probably going to be a likely target for us. Actually, down here at the bottom, this is actually one of the cabins. Here's another one that the crew sleep in. There are four of them going around in a circle. Oh yeah. Anyway, show us show us the crew quarters. But in any case, you can look at videos on this as well online. Um, so there's Samantha Cristoforetti who's showing. Um, her space and how she gets into it. So thinking as, we can think about all kinds of issues here. We can think about hierarchy. We can th think about gendering of spaces. We can think about how people from different cultures interact with one another in this kind of an environment. Um, we can think about um, intimacy and privacy. And this is almost you know the idea of the panopticon, where you're always on view. Um, there are cameras throughout, massive monitoring what's happening. Where do these people find privacy? Where do they find time for, and what kind of leisure activities are there available to them, other, other than just looking out the window? Right? Sometimes they bring musical instruments and things like this. But on Skylab, for example, we know that they came up with games like trying to shoot themselves through uh, the entire length of it without hitting any barriers. That was a game that they came up with, right? You know. But so here's here's a galley right here. This is in uh, uh, Spezda, the uh, span, uh, span, uh, Russian module. We've, again, the crew quarters are on either side. But this is where they eat. We know that there are times of conflict on, on the space station. For example, in Expedition 19, actually the guy you were just looking at in the exercise the, uh, image I was showing you before, if we can go back to the PowerPoint. Um, actually, that might be him there as well, Gennady Padalka, um, was concerned about whether he was allowed to use the American exercise equipment. And he flew up into this whole thing. I thought I could use it. No, we can't use it. And they actually, like, the crew was told, OK, the Americans eat their own food in their module. The Russians eat their food in their module. This must have been terrible for crew morale. Uh, how is that reflected in the material record? Can we study that? 
So those kinds are some of the kinds of issues that we're talking about. Um, there, sorry. Um, the food that they eat, this is the lettuce that they actually grew in space. Um, but again, as I was talking about, I've just been showing you uh, uh, men for, for the most part here. So what about the female experience uh, on space or hierarchies? So, um, so we have a commander and crew in this image. You know, and different aspects of, of their lives. Um, so that's really a kind of quick and dirty explanation of one of the things we'd like to do. We could also do a questionnaire of astronauts, um, but we could even train an astronaut to go and do an archaeological survey. We can't go because it costs $75 million. Uh, I don't think any granting agency will give us that. Um, but we could train an astronaut to do this just as they are trained to do physics or chemistry experiments. Why not? So these are, this is what we're hoping to get off the ground. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them at this point. I think I've gone over my time anyway. <laughs> There you go. Um, any <laughs> questions? We can, we can flow. Justin, yeah, we'll flow to each other. <laughs> any questions for Justin? Yes, Chris. Um, one thing I liked about um, what you're talking about on the moon, because I remember when they did the first moon landing, the Native American communities, this is a famous thing that archaeologists learn, right? Native American communities were outraged because they considered the moon sacred, sacred. land. Yes, absolutely. And so when you were the talking about the cultural meanings of these, the yeah. cultural heritage of these sites, which is such an incredible way to think about them, but it's also Whose heritage? Absolutely. And we, like as academics Absolutely. in the Western world, say, well, it's global human heritage. But One actually, small step for for who? Right. <laughs> Not for you, by the way. Just for man. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so like yeah. that was a gendered statement. Right? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Anyway, it's just it's kind of interesting to think about the different like whose heritage would be accounted for because Native Americans rejected, well, yeah. some Native Americans rejected as not approved. Yeah, absolutely. Alice and I have been talking actually about people we'd like to include in the project in various ways. And we were really uh, enthused about the idea of finding somebody who's from a com country that didn't participate, didn't have a space program, mm -hmm. um, and seeing what, what kind of re response and reactions they were able to bring to the project as well. So that's something we've, we've certainly considered and would like to pursue. It seems like such a good idea already. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm having a hard time articulating the question in my head. But what I'm thinking is, this sounds more like anthropology than archaeology, because it's occupied right now. Yes. Uh, so there is a branch of archaeology called contemporary archaeology uh, that I find extremely, well, it's what we'll be doing, but there are certain people doing it that I find extremely inspirational. Uh, there's the, the School of Archaeology at the University of New York. Uh, dug their own dig van in 2006. The van that they took to sites, they actually excavated that and published it in 2011. Um, that was really cool. Uh, and one of the people there that we are hoping to work with, John Schofield, who's the chair of that, that school, uh, he actually has done an archaeological project at CERN, studying the culture of CERN in Switzerland. Uh, so that would be very uh, analogous, right? Because it's an ongoing thing, but it's also scientific, technological. Um, so if you've done a survey of CERN from an archaeological perspective. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right, though, about anthro and even sociology. I think can really be key to this. So I said do a questionnaire. Right? That's a sociological kind of technique, right? And I'm personally very inspired by the work of Jason Devalon. I don't know if you know his recent book, The Land of Open Graves, about uh, it was the undocumented migration project, looking at people who are coming across the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and he used a variety of these kinds of techniques, experimental archaeology, but he also interviewed uh, migrants. He actually gave cameras to migrants, and they crossed the border and took photographs of their own. This is like me asking an astronaut to go and survey the site, right? Um, and so I find a lot of that really inspirational and, and, and um, uh, really helping me to think outside the box, which I need to do if I'm going to do a project like this. So I think you're absolutely right to hit the nail on the head. Yeah. How long do you think it would take to train an astronaut? Ah, that's a good question. I don't think we've even gotten to the stage of thinking about what we'd ask them to do. Beyond, well, we can we can ask them to uh, to to survey, you know, what the experience of being up there is. I mean, so sights, sounds, smells, those kinds of things. We know, for example, that astronauts frequently complain about the amount of noise on ISS, which they can't escape. And the ventilation and things like this, so that all they can do is put in earplugs, 
know, what is that, how does that affect their experience of being on board and their ability to communicate with each other as well. Um, we can also ask them to sample the surface for dust and hair cells. I actually, I was talking to somebody in the ISS office, and they're like, they clean it all the time. I'm like, even so, I'm sure there's some residue there that indicate, like as if there's a soil being created. And there actually are geologists who are working on the anthrop anthropomorphic aspects, or the anthrop anthropized, I guess you'd say, aspects of soil creation. And so uh, we, can, we can also look at that kind of thing. Uh, how long it would take to train them to do that? I, I don't know, a month or two maybe? I mean, it wouldn't have to be like they're learning all the techniques of you know, how you survey a site, you know, um, using instruments like a total station and things like that. It wouldn't be like that because we already know what the space looks like. So I think it would be relatively limited if it's still worthwhile. You had a question? Yeah. From a media platform standpoint, mm -hmm. where do you envision this living? Like, is it a VR experience? Or yeah. A web experience? Yeah. So thinking about the 3D aspect mm -hmm. of it, absolutely. So uh, it turns out my cousin works uh, in game design. So I was able to bounce a lot of ideas <laughs> off of him about this. And so I think what we would really love to do in a perfect world is to hire a video game designer mm -hmm. and a model designer, a model artist, and uh, an interface specialist so that we could move around the way that we were moving around that, that model that we were looking at online, except better. Like we could actually move like in all dimensions instead of just being stuck at one point in each module like that is. Um, and that we would put it online. I think public outreach would be a huge Absolutely. part of this. Yeah. Um, and that would, that, that's definitely a thing that we want mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it is going to depend on the agreements that we come to with NASA about the public dissemination of the data mm -hmm. that we have. But um, but mm -hmm. as long as that's possible, I think we would love to do it. Cool. I, would, I would think that if you've got, <clears throat> I mean, I was thinking of a, uh, what this would be as a video game, and that itself there is a video game. Oh, really? There is a video game that was released in 2005 called Space Station Sim. I was able to buy it. I was able to buy it. It's still available on Amazon. Uh, it only runs when you have it in your disk drive, unfortunately. So it wasn't uh, and it's an outdated version of what the space station was going to be. The plans have changed since 2005. Uh, but it is really like a Sims thing where you have to sustain your astronauts and they have to carry out tasks. And I love the reviews. The reviews were like, this is so boring. <laughs> all, you, all you do is you keep fixing things, and you, you have to you like look after experiments. And it's like, who wants to play this? But that's what it actually is like for the astronauts out there. So I think that's a really interesting. Um, I, I think that that response, those reviews, and the interaction that a gaming community would have with this data is another whole layer of mm -hmm. I don't know if anthropology or archaeology or what, but that. That's, that's sort of like sending a thousand extra astronauts out to inhabit the space and see what mm -hmm. they would do. Absolutely. You know, that data might have to be another whole, whole. So there actually is now a nascent uh, uh, subdiscipline of archaeology called archaeo gaming. Really? Yes. Oh. Where you are you are both looking at video games themselves as artifacts, but also you can be exploring games as archaeologists. And there's a lot that's interesting there too because the archaeology is often used as a kind of a a paradigm within those worlds, so you are an archaeologist, or you're asked to do things like loot sites. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time, and trade the things that you find, right? So it's interesting the ways in which people who are not archaeologists understand archaeology and try to include that in games, and that's something you can investigate. Yeah, and so combining some of the insights from these, the, my colleagues who are into archaeo gaming, combining some of those insights with what we're doing, I think can be very valuable. Contemporary archaeology is a cool new thing. Yes? How many different countries are currently using the ISS? And has it started with this two, grown to many, many more? Well, no. From, so originally, this was Space Station Freedom, <coughs> as it was announced by Ronald Reagan in his 1984 State of the Union Address. And it was initially being trumpeted as something that the commercial community would particularly gain benefit from. It's interesting how NASA has come back to that and current discussions for what's going to happen to the space station. Well, the idea has been for since the 1990s that it was going to be deorbited into the Pacific uh, whenever they decide to stop using it. But at the moment, 2024 appears to be the date beyond which no plans are being made. And the Russians are saying that they want to take their modules and create a new space station from those. They want to detach them and make something new. 
And NASA has been saying, it appears, that they want commercial entities to take over what they've been doing as they move on to other projects. So we'll see what happens with that. But all of that is, is also obviously transformative in the way the ways that we think about who's working in space and what they're doing there. Um, and in answer to your question about who's involved, so uh, in the, at, with the fall of the, the Berlin Wall and communism, uh, the idea was to bring the Russian space agency in on this because they had so much experience with the space stations, much more than we did. Um, and then also bring in ESA and the Japanese and the Canadians. So it's always been a consortium since then of these five space administrations. Um, but NASA's always been the lead. And basically is the one that manages it. Although the Russians have their own inventory because they actually have a set. It's like there's two sides of the space station and the, the, they have their own food. And actually something we can talk about is the fact that the Russian food comes up in cans and the, the NASA food comes up in uh, tubes. Like these, are cultural, these are cultural and engineering differences, right? And so we can, we can talk about those sorts of things and those interact. They, but they share food often, the astronauts. So, so, um, so there's a lot to talk about there. As I said, there are 25 different nations that have taken part. So for example, like Italy has built some of the modules, the Brazilians have had some input, or some, some, uh, some have done some work uh, with it. And, yeah, variety of mm -hmm. different countries that don't necessarily even have their own space programs. Mm -hmm. food, as well. food must be incredible in the Italian pod, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, it's funny. I mean, you even learn about things like uh, if they're going to eat hummus, what are they going to eat it with? They don't eat pitas, they use tortillas because no crumbs, ah. which would be a problem in microgravity. So things like that. And also, actually, another point is that that inventory management system I was talking about, I was told by somebody who worked on it that they actually don't know where something like 2% of the items that they send up there are. <laughs> they're lost because they float away and they get behind things. <laughs> so that's, I mean, thinking about objects and material culture on this really. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Justin. Yeah. We'll be around for a little bit longer. And we're on Twitter now. And you're on Twitter. We have, our, we have, we've just launched this week. We already have 170 followers. Right. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you.